<coughs> the subject of these lectures is an overview of the extraordinary variety of architecture in one continent in a period of thousands of years. Such a broad sweep will inevitably involve a great deal of generalization and of simplification. That's the course is about Asia. But unfortunately, a great deal of what I'm saying about the development there is true of other cultures as well. So there is a kind of global dimension in the course. I shall sometimes have to go outside of what is strictly Asian to make a point that is clearer outside. <coughs> the series of lectures is intended as a brief introduction to the principal cultures of Asia and their buildings. It will trace the domestic architecture of many regions of Asia and in each area it will attempt to show how it relates to the development of the religious buildings of that culture. Overall, I will try to examine the question of the genesis of architecture and of urbanism as conscious responses to the environment, to social conditions and to beliefs and ideologies. In the first lecture, I am going to discuss the development of human understanding in early man. A good place to start, perhaps, would be with the writings of Umberto Eco, who is very pertinent to us because he is an anthropologist and a linguist who became interested in the way in which human society developed in relation to everyday experiences, to built form and to life. He is one of the best theorists of linguistics and one of the best anthropologists of our time, as well as being a famous novelist and poet. I'm going to read you an extract from an article Umberto Eco wrote on architecture. Let us imagine the point of view of the man who started the history of architecture. Still all wonder and wildness driven by cold and rain and following the example of some animal or perhaps obeying an instinct and reasoning which are mixed up in his mind, this Stone Age man takes shelter in a recess in a cave from the cold and the rain, some recess or hole in the side of a mountain in a cliff. When he is sheltered from the wind and the rain, he examines the cave by daylight, or if there is not enough light, he may light a fire. We may assume that he had already discovered fire. We are pretty sure that fire was discovered half a million years ago. That is about two thirds of the time since human beings as we know them first developed. So he examines the interior of the cave. He notices the height of the cave and he understands that that is the limit of space. He compares that with his experience of outside space and he realizes that there is a limit to the space in the cave. He can't touch the ceiling as it's very high, so it's a lot of space, but there is a limit to it. So for the very first time, he understands the notion of limitation. The illustration is of a cliff in China containing a famous group of caves. So to go on with Umberto Eco. This early man understands the height of the vault of the cave and he sees that the cave is cut off from the wind and the rain by this vault, which he now perceives as the beginning of a new idea for him inside space as opposed to outside space. And this evokes in him an emotion, an emotion of protection, which is still imprecise and ambiguous at this stage, seen 
particularly as it is in this cave, under the play of light and shadow. But he gets very interested in the cave. So once the storm is over, he leaves the cave and reconsiders it from the outside. Maybe going in again and coming out again. He notes that there is an entry to it, a hole that per permits passage from the outside space to the inside space. He notes that the passage recalls to his mind the image of the inside. So he's only to see the hole in the cliff to remember the inside space. So the idea of a cave forms in his mind, which is useful at least as a memory device, enabling him to think of the cave later as a possible objective in case of rain. But it also enables him to recognize in another cave the same possibility of shelter that he found in the first cave. So at the next cave that he tries during a rainstorm, the idea of that cave is replaced by the idea of cave itself. That is the idea of a model, of a type, which is the basic concept of cave. Something which exists on the basis of which he can recognize a certain set of phenomena as cave. So that is the end of Umberto Eco. You have in this essay not only the idea of the cave, but the idea of a concept being developed in the human mind. And once the idea of forming a generalized concept as a memory device becomes common to the human beings, they start to use these devices in every experience. The next stage is the formation of generative concepts, which enable men to work with the concepts they experience as the basis of architecture. So let's go to a typical cave And this is characteristic of human habitations all over the world, going back many thousands of years. Now we come to a cave in Malta, which has been improved inside. It has been given a second facade, a, a second cave beyond the first. So this is some sort of sanctuary where the inner cave is a sacred space. From there, it is only a step to making caves above ground, man-made man caves. The concept of cave is now used to create a building. <coughs> this happened in Malta, and it also happened in many other parts of the world. But the best preserved examples of these very early man-made caves is in Malta. The reason why they have survived, of course, is that they are made in stone. The islands of Malta don't have much vegetation, so they have to make the buildings in stone. In many other areas, uh, early attempts at building were, of course, made in, pan in materials which weathered and were destroyed. The Maltese made them on a big scale because they were intended as communal sanctuaries for prayer. Because they made them on this scale, they are the oldest man-made ceremonial roofed buildings in the world. We have always thought that these would have been the pyramids, but that is not true. The oldest are the temples of Malta. <coughs> they are 500 years older than the Egyptian pyramids, and they are much older than Stonehenge. These are the oldest ceremonial architectures in the true sense of the word that we know of in the world. Today, it is true that they have lost their roofs. We have only the walls on the lower levels. The original, originally, the world, roofs were created of vaults in stone, covered with thick layers of earth and made into hills, which were then turfed with grass. 
and on each temple there was only one facade, which was like a cliff, a man-made cliff. And an interesting thing about the man-made cliff was that it had a seat in front of it. So presumably a row of religious elders sat there and there was a paved area in front of the hill, in front of the cliff, where the congregation could assemble, presumably only a few of them who were priests being allowed inside the shrine. There were a series of apses made out of vertical stones and then kept with corbelled vaulting done in horizontal stones which were originally extended up until the semicircular vaults, vaults all joined together at the top to make a dome. So that is one of the side chapels. That is the main chapel. There were five chapels in each of these shrines. And each of these five apses was a separate chapel. There was also an outside wall of vertical stones, and then the whole thing was covered on top of the vaulting. <coughs> what do we know about the beliefs that were associated with that kind of architecture? We get a hint from the sculptured statues that have been found there. They are not actually statues because as far as we know, they were not raised on a pedestal and put vertically. They were often shown lying down horizontally and they seem to have represented sleeping princesses. But of course they were priestesses or female goddesses. That might be a representation of the goddess of creation, the Earth Mother. Is there an allegory to be observed here between the plan of the Maltese cave temples and an idealized image of a god or a religious human being? There is a definite possibility that the form of the statue of the Earth Mother is reflected in the plan of the temple. Does the plan with its head and four apses, so that it symbolizes a very buxom Roman woman? <coughs> Is there another allegory present? The allegory of the womb from which we are born. So if you believe, as most scholars do, based on recent research, that the Mediterranean peoples and Western Asian peoples believed that all creation originally came from a creator goddess, an earth goddess who lived underground. And indeed, one of the great caves of the earth goddess has been found in Crete. If you believe that, as apparently the Maltese did, then we have all been generated as human beings from the womb of an earth goddess. And this temple might be seen as a double allegory of both the earth goddess and her womb the womb from which we were born, from which all human beings and all human creation came. So here is an example of the level on which concepts become metamorphosed into allegories, a central part of architectural expression throughout history to the present day. Less so perhaps in the present day. It is not nearly as important now as it was 100 years ago or 200 years ago. But the allegorical dimension in architecture is still there, witness buildings like the Sydney Opera House. So here is a building which is representative of creation, of a goddess, of a cave, all in one time. It is the shelter of a mother, the shelter of a mother goddess, and the shelter of a cave combined together in one experience. There are 27 cave temples surviving in the Maltese islands, dating over a period of one and a half thousand years, and the earliest is 3,200 years BC. There is evidence that similar sorts of buildings were built over vast areas of the world but most of them in other materials. They have either not survived or archeologists have not yet found them. 
But we do have lots of evidence of the tradition in slightly later buildings in Mesopotamia and in Persia. Continuing down to modern times in China, Syria and Asia. And in many parts of the world, you might find representations of the mother goddess, that very early form of religion. Associated with that seems to have been the practice of a female priestess divining the future, often after a ritual uh, of being put to sleep, sometimes drug-induced. Now, descended from all that, we have the first tangible evidences of the architecture of a great civilization in the western part of Asia and the eastern part of the Mediterranean, the Aegean Sea. <coughs> the, least, the, the, the picture on the left shows two clay models from a tomb representing a very, very early temples in the Aegean. And they, and they were temples which were clearly derived from the form of a house. We know from archaeological excavations that what the houses were like at that time. The very early example shown here is not far away from the Maltese temples. And it's a very atypical Aegean house. At this time, the Maltese temples were still being built. Although it looks from this family, from this drawing, as if it's a house for only one family, the figures are actually too big. And we know that the house was meant to accommodate large extended families of 20 or 30 or maybe more people living in them. What was typical of these houses was that they were entered with only one doorway. There were no windows. There was an occasional tiny vent to let out smoke. In the middle was a fire. Naturally, they needed that to cook on uh, because, because cooking had become an important part of hygiene by this time. And the fire was also the center of warmth for winter. So associated with the cave concept and to protect the fire, you needed shields on the sides against the wind. I'd like to take you back for a moment to a separate analysis. The architect Gottfried Semper, a leading figure in the mid-19th century, thought that there were four stages in which early man would conceive of a work of architecture starting from first principles. The first stage would be the focus of the future life in the building. The focus of life would naturally become the hearth. So the first necessary element of early architecture was the hearth. Once the decision to have a hearth was made, then one has to concern oneself with protecting the fire from the elements. The first threat to the fire was dampness or flooding. And for that reason, the hearth had to be raised up a little bit above the ground to protect, to protect it from flooding and dampness and creating a dry platform. So if the fire is the first element, the second is the raised platform or plinth. The third architectural decision was to keep the rain off the hearth and the sitting area around it. So they built a roof over it. And the fourth architectural decision was to prevent the wind from blowing the fire. <laughs> they achieved that by placing curtains or screens at the sides. Returning to our Greek house, you can see that the earliest Greek house had these four concepts these four architectural principles. It has a paved dry floor, which is undoubtedly slightly higher than the surrounding land. It has a roof over the top, to keep out the rain, and it has walls very cleverly arranged so that the wind can't blow in. 
So you could go inside to shelter from the rain, take off one's wet clothes at the entrance, even one protect one's animals from the rain without going into the room with fire. That could be protected also, closed off by a door. When one entered into the area of the fire, only one, only one thing has to be added to the architecture, might be a storeroom at the back. Of course, it could be used more for other things besides stories, storage, and we know that it was also used by women to allow privacy, particularly during childbirth. We know this from the study of such rooms in other cultures. That is called the dark room. <clears throat> but basically, this is Semper's diagram with a slight improvement. It is essentially a cave which has a fire in the middle of it, but is man-made. Now you probably know that that kind of building is called a megaron in ancient Greek. And from these very prim ancient primitive beginnings, you have the, the developed Greek temple and also the great megara of the Mycenaean civilization and the early Greek civilizations. Passing on in time, here is the great hall of a palace of a very important ruler in Troy dating from 2700 BC. So that is 500 years later than the first great temple in Malta. But it is still a cave, cave concept, isn't it? <laughs> it is still a cave concept, isn't it? And this has very many of the same attributes as I've just discussed. Over on the right, you have a more complicated one. Which you have ever, in which you have evidence of craftsmanship at work. They have a workshop attached to the main living space. And then one begins to proliferate, and one starts to find a series of megara, of which the main one has a fireplace, and there are others which are used for other activities. This is the typical kind of grouping that one finds at the beginning of Cretan civilization and the beginning of Mycenaean civilization. Notice that these examples I am giving are not in Asia, but any cultural historian will say that the, that the division at the eastern end of the Mediterranean is a very artificial one, and that the, the influences from the Mediterranean pervaded in ancient times right through to Mesopotamia and Persia and in reverse, the Mesopotamian and Persian influences per per pervade right through the middle of the Mediterranean. Malta is actually regarded, regarded in cultural terms as part of Asian civilization. And the earliest towns around 1200 BC that we know of in uh, Turkey and Greece and possibly uh, they extended around the, uh, Black, the Black Sea, but have since been drowned in the floods. We know that there were dozens, if not hundreds, of such buildings formed, all conceived together like caves, uh, with a fire in the middle of each one, and a grouping to form a small town. The Megara thus became the characteristic forms from which the Greek temples were developed. So here you see the link between the secular and the sacred. Here is the Megaron of Tyrans, built about 2200 BC and in, already in decline by 1100 BC. To repeat that the Megaron is a direct ancestor of the Greek temple and the link to the cave is very clear. Here is a later one from 500 BC in an archaeological excavation in Cyprus. And you see all the surrounding buildings and the colonnaded forecourt to it. But the type continues. In the next example, we have one which is only from 300 BC in the ancient, the ancient Turkish town of uh, Priene 
the meager in here was just like a cave, and it was the main room of the house, approached through a portico and entered by a single door. There were no windows, and a single fire was in the middle of the floor with a vent in the roof. So the Greeks were building that form of house for over 2,000 years and more. And the link to the temple is obvious, which is making another point. In no, nearly all societies, religious buildings are closely related to secular buildings. <clears throat> Coming up to the present day, what about man-made ca caves in recent times? Here are examples from Lebanon and Syria, built up until about 70 years ago. You can see that in the center of each house, there is an open cave acting as a covered courtyard and the focus of life of the house. And it was so placed that it turned its back to any strong winds. The recessed cave usually had two rooms off it on either side. One was a room for privacy of the women, in which childbirth took place, and the other was a storeroom. Everyday life took place in the so-called so Iwan, a central covered cave, which gave shade from the sun and protection from the rain. These houses were numbered in hundreds only 70 years ago, and that was the prevailing form of house in many areas of Lebanon and Syria. Some of them dated back to the Middle Ages, as you can see here, with pointed arched openings. As an aside, the idea of a cave as the center of life takes that form in many parts of the Middle East. And here it is in Italy. <clears throat> the ancient kind of house along the east coast of Italy was called a cassoni, and was, of course, uh, 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 derived from the cave in the same way, and it is very clearly the ancestor of the Palladian house. So the neoclassical house can trace its roots back to the cave. This shows how a concept can generate architecture. Besides horizontal caves, there was another kind of prehistoric cave, the pit or vertical cave. The earliest farming clearly developed in river valleys, and we now know that one of the earliest areas in which that happened was in South Russia and in the plains of northern Turkey. Most of that area drowned since, but it has been possible for archaeologists to find vertical caves of very great antiquity in the delta of the Volga River in Russia. So the people who lived in this vertical cave were farming and grazing their animals in the river plain, and they couldn't get any access within an easy walking distance to a cliff or a mountainside, so they compromised by making their home in the uh, shallow level plain of the mouth of the river. So the alluvial plain was excavated to usually to a depth of about eight or ten feet. It was a soft material. It was very easy to, uh, to dig it out. There's a huge amount of, ar of archaeological evidence to show that in every agricultural or pastoral community there was a favorite way of, build of living in these excavated pits in the ground. The oldest man-made construction in the world that we know of is in this example from archaeology in southern Russia, 40,000 BC. They had discovered, of course, that they could climb down into these pits by ladders. Even though wood was scarce, some could be brought down the river from the forests upstream. There were a number of hearths or fireplaces at the bottom of the pit, in all about five in this case. The upper edge was lined with great bones from Mastodon, the great prehistoric elephants of the Russian plains. 
But why were the, bone, the bones arranged around the edge of the cave, of the vertical cave? What if they were weighing down something? Well, the cave is not much good as a shelter for, from the elements in its present form. It certainly would shelter you from wind, but not from rain or storms. So it would have to have been covered with something. And that was certainly, almost certainly achieved using animal skins sewn together. So a great tent stretched from one side of the cave to the other edge and it was weighed down with bones around the edges. We know from the number of hearths that the cave sheltered more than one family, but housed a large number of people. <coughs> the oldest villages and towns that have ever anywhere been found are again in the much the same area, around the Black Sea and in the uh, plateau of Turkey. And they date between 8,000 and 6,000 BC. They contain houses which were actually built above ground, but are still entered vertically from roof level. The roofs were solidly constructed on wooden beams and meant to be more permanent. Shown here is one of the inside of these caves in a conjectural drawing at the most famous of these villages which has been excavated, Katal Huyak in Turkey. That particular cave was probably not a house, but actually this seems to be a sacred room. There was a shrine in it to one of the greatest of the domesticated animals at that time, a symbol of virility, a symbol of strength, a symbol of everything that was noble in the best men that were human beings. So the bull became an icon in itself, and that is, of course, shown clearly in the bullfights that were practiced in ancient Crete and up to this day in Spain and southern France. One can see that there were no doors in the excavation, but that the buildings were all entered from above. So here's a little village from between 7,500 and 6,000 BC. The oldest monumental building we know of is 3,200 BC. So there is nearly a 5,000 year difference. <clears throat> so where are the other monumental buildings? Perhaps they were all like these vertical caves, and perhaps there were uh, monumental vertical caves which have not yet been found. Now I'd like to pass on to some examples of vertical caves today. These are in the northwestern part of Pakistan and in Afghanistan and southern Russia. They are typical of the whole region that runs through Afghanistan into Iran, where to this day people live in the mountains in vertical caves. The reason why they don't dig a cave down into the ground is because the rocks are too hard. And the reason why they are vertical caves has got something to do with the fact that they are on steep slopes and it's hard to build a larger building. It is intriguing that they enter through the roof. That is probably, obviously, a very ancient tradition, an ancient archetype that they still felt the need to use. This particular one has a window, but then you must remember that they are uh, currently bringing these houses up to date. Originally, they wouldn't have had windows. So we're back in northern Pakistan, and here you see uh, what these houses look like from the top. And there is the upper courtyard entrance at roof level. Then there is a very small opening with a ladder, and you go down into the main room of the house in a, a series of, of ladders. And here we have the main room of the house at the bottom, with its roof constructed of cantilevered wood, rather than cantilevered stone, as you saw in the temples of Malta. The fireplace, of course, in its position at the bottom of the house, keeps the whole house warm, 
and it's a very cold part of the world, so they are dressed against the cold as well. <clears throat> this is a contemporary building, still being lived in, and there are thousands of them in that area. They are only entered from the top. The same concepts of horizontal caves and vertical caves existed all over the world until fairly recent times. Here, for instance, is a typical example of a horizontal cave in North America, and of course there were hundreds of thousands of such examples in Africa. The horizontal caves usually had only a small opening at the top to let the smoke out. Before I start to talk about the architecture in the Pacific, which I'm only going to deal with very briefly, I, it is worth introducing it by discussing the word history. There are a number of different kinds of history. The one that we rely on most is written history. But actually, writing in any form that made intelligible history was a very late development. In Greece, for instance, it was only in the 6th century BC that we find any written sources that we can use for historical research. But when it comes to the Pacific, the writings are amazingly recent. In most cases, they first learnt to write from Christian missionaries. So in most areas of the Pacific, the written texts that we have are no more than 150 years old. But we do have wonderful architecture in the Pacific, and the question is, how old is that? Anthropologists are still trying to work away at the age of some of the buildings in the Pacific. Here, for instance, are two types of buildings. The one at the bottom, a very characteristic one, showing stone men here, as they are called, which represent gods, or in some cases they may represent heroes. We have no, no, no way of knowing whether they represent a, a great ruler or a legendary hero, or indeed a divinity. Possibly they served all three. <clears throat> but as this kind of a rectangular enclosure is so very beautifully made with many ears, and the standing stones at the end, which have to be approached from the opposite end through a gateway, it's obviously very ceremonial. This type of gathering place is characteristic of many of the Pacific Islands. How old is the tradition? Well, no one is able to say that. They date much earlier than 700 or 800 years AD. But perhaps one day, someone will be able to prove that they are much older. At the top, we have a very curious structure, which is not fully stood, understood either, a ceremonial platform for shooting bows and arrows from. Is the shape symbolic? And if so, what is, is it symbolic of? <clears throat> These are always the same shape, and there are hundreds of them in some of the Pacific Islands. Are they meant to serve a ceremonial purpose? If so, is there a sacred meaning associated with the act of, show, of firing the arrow? Again, they date back six or seven hundred years, we believe, beyond any written record. Here is a great ceremonial site from Easter Island, and here are the standing stones carved to represent gods. They are arranged in a straight row. They are clearly meant to be approached in a very ceremonial way onto this great platform, and one has to assume that they are the focus of communal gatherings, perhaps of ceremonies, with respect for the gods. Again, this kind of gathering place is found in many islands in the Pacific. Another surprising discovery in the Pacific Islands 
is the presence of these standing stones of huge size for many years, which are like those of Stonehenge and of many other parts of Europe and Asia. There is a cross stone at the top, and they are not built in a circle as at Stonehenge, but nearly always single or in, arranged in a, a group of, of, in a straight line. They are very large in scale and involve an amazing amount of work to put them up. We simply don't understand uh, the link between the function of these great arches or great entrance gates and ceremonial uh, tradition in, a, in the Pacific. Even more surprising are these strange columns in pairs carrying what appear to be capitals. There is a great deal of dispute about these. They are again, again great stone constructions, uh, and like structure capitals, and uh, uh, appear very practical. But some archaeologists argue that they are actually uh, the supporting elements for a great wooden structure which has disappeared. But not ever, everyone agrees. They may be uh, platforms for offerings to the gods. There is no firm evidence about how old they are, but it is assumed that they are, again, 1,300 or 1,400 years old. In the Hawaiian Islands, there were very elaborate ceremonial enclosures, and they were survived into up to recent times in very uh, perishable materials. And illustrated here is a sacred enclosure with uh, a prayer room, a shrine room, a series of platforms ascending in height, culminating in towers with sacred fires, fires at their tops. These were very characteristic of the Hawaiian Islands and I, I, idealizations using geometrical design. Symbolic of the types of architecture they were all using, already using for houses. Again, it seems to be some offering of fire to the gods. But now we come to another kind of form, which you could say is the development of the cave too, but it is a cave you don't enter except on very special occasions, because the contents are sacred and they are under the mounds of earth. And this is a ceremonial mound, a memorial mound, signifying the importance of the site, or more likely, the importance of the person or of the god who is being commemorated and recognized. Again, we don't have written texts, so we can't be sure what they signify. We have similar mounds in many parts of the world. We are not certain, but we think they may symbolize heroes or great rulers, and they may contain the relics of these rulers. Now, of course, similar burial mounds are the ancestors of the Buddhist stupa, which we will be talking about later, and which comes directly from mounds like this. I'm so sorry, I'm going to start it again. We know that there was a moment in time when a great Indian ruler, Ashoka, announced that he was going to build 12 stupas in 12 memorial mounds in honor of the Lord Buddha. And each, each would have the ashes of one twelfth of the ashes of the, Lord, of the Lord Buddha. In that case, it's clear that the mound was celebrating a great person, a great individual, and contains his relics. In other cases, there is still wide debate about function. One thing about the mound that is very interesting is that it's almost always perfectly circular. Now, the perfect circular, the circle is significant, isn't it? I'm showing you here an ancient Persian plaque, which is significantly a representation of the new moon. 
it's a symbol of the divinity in the heaven and obviously is the source of the divinity of the ruler underneath. Why would the moon be a source of symbolism of significance of the heavens? <clears throat> when we come to early documents, we find that the moon is much more often the source of the symbolism of divinity than the sun is. For instance, for instance in ancient Greek mythology, the sun is simply the son of God, Apollo. And in other religions, the sun was the sun of the moon. And in many parts of the world, the mound tombs are perfectly circular. So that the circular became a primary symbol for prehistoric man. And for anything sacred, uh, the circle tends to be used in representation, as it has gone on to be used until modern times in many religious buildings, particularly, of course, the symbolism of Islam. And then, of course, because they, they were thought to be ruling through divine right, the circle becomes a symbol of royalty. A typical house from very early times in Mesopotamia, about 6,000 BC, is circular. You can see the niches in the walls, seemingly for cupboards. There was clearly a central fire. There seems to have been a shrine on one side and the fire side opposite the entrance. And we come to some very early uh, representations of the cave and find that the central space, the final space for the fire, was circular. So this one is combining together the concept of the cave and the concept of the divine space the circular image of the moon. What is less common is the idea of circular communities, but these very rapidly were developed in Central Asia, in parts of Persia, and of course in parts of Africa as well. So you get huge buildings in which whole communities lived, and eventually we come to the idea of circular towns and circular cities like ancient Baghdad. And the circle becomes the symbol of royalty, as here we have in ancient Persia, with the king surrounded by his subjects, all represented in rows of circles. And the symbol of divinity in ancient India uh, was the mantra. And one of the ways in which the mantra is worked was for the ancient Hindus and Buddhists was that the culmination of the circle was approached through a series of man uh, or secular shaped squares. Uh, so the importance of the circle is undeniable religious, religiously and it seems to have cosmology as the source of it. The fact that the sun and the moon are perfect circles to the eye. And here you have the original uh, circular town in Central Asia as it has been excavated with a great fortress in the center. And here, of course, is the plan of ancient Baghdad after it was founded in the 8th century AD by the Abbasids. Eventually it was uh, slowly, it became too small and was extended and became lost in the modern plan of the town. I don't have to remind you that when the Chinese moved from the world of men, that is the house or the man-made building, to the world of nature, they changed the shape of the door to one symbolic of the moon, the moon gate. That is, they represented nature in the shape of the circle, the natural spiritual world. And in China, when they wished to welcome in the new year, where the, they had the emperor to stand and embrace the heavens and welcome in the next season, uh, it became an astrological event 
related to cosmology. And of course, they needed for that a series of circular platforms and circular temples. Temples in China, which were temples to uh, celebrate the harvest, and uh, these were also circular because of the relationship to the forces of nature. Some communities felt that they needed to be protected by circles. So the circles become the symbol of divinity protecting them, and they are used for even the basis of temporary tents. For instance, tribes, nomadic tribes who roam through large parts of northern China and Central Asia, uh, the build these temporary yurts, transportable tents, but which are, are perfect circles when erected. And they are thought to be the ancestors of quite a, a, a number of house types and building forms in the Hakka areas. Here are yurts protected from the weather with waterproof blankets on the outside. And in other parts of the world, that is in the estuaries of the Euphrates, and the Tiber rivers in Mesopotamia, circles are used in horizontal building form and again, again meant to have religious significance. They, it was also a practical form, the circle, but, they fact, tried, but the fact is that they tried to make the shape of the curve as close to a circle as possible. <coughs> Perhaps I should just end by talking about uh, where these early civilizations were, apart from the Black Sea, which is still an unknown quantity to a large extent, um, the earliest uh, societies were in Mesopotamia and very near Asia in Egypt. Next. But uh, almost exactly contemporary was the Indus Valley, Valley civilization uh, in what is now Pakistan. They used to think it was later, and they're now beginning to think that it was almost identically the same. That is, they're all from about 3000 BC in their uh, organized form. That is, this, they reached the stage where there was some sort of central authority controlling everything. And that happened in the Indus, they think, uh, about uh, 3000, 2500 to 3000 BC. I say a central authority, of course, some of them were. Uh, rulers of just large cities and they control the surrounding area. So in Mesopotamia you didn't have one king to begin with, you had a series of towns controlling the whole river valley. But the point is they did control the whole thing. And at the same time that was happening in China. And what is missing in this diagram is Vietnam, which they now know was very early too. Uh, Vietnam is possibly even earlier than northern China. And again, it's a matter for investigation that's going on at the moment. But Vietnam is very early. Next. When you come to urbanization uh, and it becomes developed, we have the accompaniment of new forms of religious building. All take the same variation of form as though they were building sacred mountains. That is an obvious building form for drawing attention to religious significance in a flat river plain. The taller the building is, the more important and sacred it becomes. So towers begin to evolve, probably from the earth mounds, and are definitely related to urbanization. They don't take up very much room in a tight urban environment and they stand out from the houses and public buildings of the rest of the town. These ancient Mesopotamian ziggurats constitute the earliest towers we have and are approached up huge flights of stairs leading to temples on the top. And they seem to be early analogies to the homes of the gods being on sacred mountains. Perhaps if one lives in a river plain, 
the idea that the gods lived in the mountains was very appealing. These ziggurats have mostly been destroyed in the last 4,000 years or 5,000 years, but they were uncovered only two centuries or one and a half centuries ago. They are huge and made out of solid brick and solid masonry. Some of the ziggurats have the, wall, the lower walls left, and one was able to obtain an idea of the marvelous workmanship in some of them, which are the earliest monumental buildings uh, in Western Asia, but not as early as the temples of Malta. The earliest of the surviving ziggurats do not go back much before 2000 BC. Quite a lot later, later on, sacred mountains were being built in East Asia, uh, mostly related to Hinduism and Buddhism. Again, that is a very basic idea. In a fairly flat area, usually a plain, a tower or an artificial mountain was built to represent the home of the gods or of a god. This example is one of the most sacred shrines of the Lord Buddha uh, represented on a sacred mountain in Indonesia. It's Borobudur. But many of these sacred towers and sacred mountains were built in Southeast Asia, in China, Cambodia, Vietnam, and Laos. There were smaller shrines and smaller sacred towers on the larger base of the platform. And you find them not only in Indonesia and Indochina, but also, of course, the most famous ones are in Angkor Wat. Here are the shrines of the uh, Bodhisattvas, Borobudur. Sim similar, sac similar sacred towers were a very early tradition in Hinduism, and we have them in uh, some of the rock cut temples. Yeah, most ancient ones on the eastern side of India, and also in the great gateways of the southern temples, where the home of the great creator god Brahma is represented on the top of the sacred mountain. And here is a similar sort of tower in Sri Lanka, drawing attention to a relig religious site. Here they are in China, pagodas again, sacred towers representing a sacred site as a kind of sacred mountain. They were originally made of masonry in China, but later in wood and tiles. This diagram shows, shows some of the forms of sacred mountain that were spread around East Asia. So this culminated in Japan with the marvelous alternating tower rooms of the pagoda drawing attention to the site and to its sacredness. Here we have the same manifestation in the culmination of the temple in its sacred room, the cellar, with the home of the great creator god represented by circular building on the top of the tower. As civilization developed and spread, and you can see the lower diagram is the earliest blossoming of civilization, and the built cities, and we see the development of it in the diagrams above. That summarizes the origins of symbolism and of creative concepts in architecture uh, in the early periods, which were mostly prehistoric in Asia. We will continue with the subject in the next lecture. Thank you very much.